Genesis 26 tonight. And just a reminder, the idea here is that we go through the different patriarchs of the Old Testament. Not all of them necessarily, but uh, the main ones. So we talked about Abraham. Well, actually, before that, we, went, we were at, looking at Noah. I talked about Abraham. Now we're on Isaac, and we're overlapping a little bit with Jacob because, uh, you know, Isaac in this story, he has Jacob and Esau. And so we're talking about that a little bit. And so didn't have... Uh, Sunday evening services last week because of camping, which by the way, if I didn't tell you yet, it, it just went wonderful. Uh, really exactly, I want to say, as close as I could have pictured, uh, you know, what I was looking for for a trip is what happened. The weather was, was cooperative and uh, I mean, I would have liked to have caught a little bit more fish, but that's okay. <laughs> had a good time of fellowship and uh, uh, just everything just worked out well to get away for a couple of days with the guys and, and uh, and just enjoy that time. Um, so we didn't have services that night, but if you remember the week before, we talked about um, what did we talk about? <laughs> We're talking about uh, uh, investing. Uh, Isaac was, in, I mean, uh, um, yeah, yeah. My mind's going blank. All right. Uh, Abraham was investing in Isaac, and then we talked about the first 40 years of Isaac's life. And so, uh, if you think about it, a lot went on in those 40 years, but he wasn't even married yet. So, he still had a lot more to go, raising a family, having children, and all that kind of stuff. And so, now as we get into chapter 26, uh, we enter into the, la the last, uh, not 40 years, but the last uh, section of his life, the um, and so we're going to skip over a little bit because it starts out at the beginning of chapter 25 um, or partially through there. Of course, we, we talked about the story in 25, but then it's at the end of 25, it talks about Jacob and Esau and it begins to give the narrative there a little bit. And then it's going to insert another narrative about Isaac. Then it'll come back and, and talk about the... Um, the venison and the hairy arms and, and all the story that we're familiar with. But, but we're talking about Isaac right now. So I'm going to skip that story for now. We'll come back to it probably next week when we talk about uh, that second part of the, of the chapter. But what we're looking at tonight is chapter 26, starting in verse 12. 26, starting in verse 12. If you don't mind standing, um, I guess even if you do mind, uh, <laughs> probably... Just go do it anyway. <laughs> but we're going to read uh, chapter 26, 12 through 35. I'm, I'm going to read it to you. And Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same uh, year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants and the Philistines envied him. Remember, they're kind of in the land of the Philistines here. And all the wells which his, his father's servants had dig, digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and dwelt there, and Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names which his father had called them. And Isaac's uh, servants digged in the valley, and, uh, sorry, in the valley, and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. <coughs> And he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him that night, uh, that same night, and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, 
and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for thy, my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. And Abimelech, then Abimelech went to fetch from Gerar and Ahuzath, uh, one of the friends of Pichol, uh, I'm probably not saying those right, but Phicol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said uh, unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there, now, uh, let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and uh, as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink, and they rose up betimes in the morning, and swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass that the same, uh, passed the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and saith unto him, We have found water. And he called it Shebeth. Therefore the name of the city, Beersheba, uh, I'm sorry, Sheba, and the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. And Esau was 40 years old when he took uh, to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which was a grief of mind um, unto Isaac and to Rebekah. All right, we've already prayed, and you can be seated. Thank you for standing up for that. Um, of course, we're not worried about this part of the story, with the end of it with uh, Esau at this moment. But just kind of another portion of Isaac's life and, and Rebekah's life. Now, there was one story that we also jumped over, which is there's a new Abimelech, okay? It's not the same Abimelech as when Abraham, you know, went into Gerar and he had, uh, you know, his wife. And you remember he was like, oh, tell him you're my sister. Well, Isaac does the same thing with Rebekah. And it's pretty interesting that this happens all over again. But it's a different Abimelech and, it, and it's years later. Uh, but we see this repeated once again. So anyway... After they're there, things get resolved as far as like, okay, yeah, she is my wife and, and all this. And then he lets them dwell in the land. But then Abimelech says, you know, hey, you're too mighty, too powerful. There's no room for us. You guys are going to have to go somewhere else. And so uh, he goes to this land, uh, um, which is where Abraham was originally. And the text tells us that the Philistines, which are in that area, had filled up the wells that were dug, you know, and I don't know exactly what they looked like, but obviously they were uh, deep holes that were dug in there, and they filled them up with earth, you know, and stopped them up, it says. And so now, as Isaac is trying to find a place where he can raise his family and live and, and, uh, and, and just, you know, provide for all of his animals and all that kind of stuff, he goes into this region and all the wells are stopped up. Well, why did they do that? Well, because nobody can survive there if they don't have water. Right? You see, the first thing you need to know, and almost every civilization that you can think of is, is built upon water somehow. They're either on the coastline by the ocean, they're by rivers, you know, by just different major bodies of water. And if they're not, if they're in the plains somewhere or in the desert or whatever, they have to have some source of water. So this is why the Bible talks so much about springing wells and, and trying to find all this. And, and, uh, and so immediately we see them digging water and trying to find a place, uh, you know, where they can, they can have the success. <clears throat> so I want to just bring out some application to this. It's kind of a little bit of a... Uh, uh, and it, it just, it's just an illustration, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but an uh, allegory uh, that, you know, this, this scripture is often preached about this and maybe a little bit of a different perspective, but, you know, redigging the wells and stuff like that, you know, and, and, and coming back, I don't know, maybe you've heard preaching on this. And, and I want to just bring a uh, little bit of application to the, uh, to the story for us tonight. Okay, so number one. <clears throat> 
we must dig for water. Okay, when it comes to living the Christian life and raising a family and, and, and trying to provide for you know, what's going to be the next generation, all the things we're supposed to do as Christians, and, uh, you know, and we can even spiritualize this more, uh, but, uh, but, but obviously this is going to be a spiritual application. We have got to have the source of water. Now, literally, if we were going to a place, we'd have to look for water or else we're not going to survive. Okay, we've got to find a source of water. Where are we going to get our water from? And, uh, and this is what they do. So it makes us, we're, we're not in a culture where we think that much now because you find a house somewhere that it's got running water, it's got pipes and it's, you know, it's coming from somewhere. We don't know where. And if we run out of that, we probably don't want to drink that anyway. So we go to Walmart and, and get the gallon, uh, jug. I don't know how you get your water, but, or you got a purifier or something like that. And we just really don't think about having to go find this land and, and dig down for wells and try to figure out, I don't even even know how you know where to dig for a well. Do you? I mean, uh, I've seen cartoons where they take the stick and and pull it in the stick if it drops down. I don't think that that's true. I think that's, but uh, uh, I don't even know where you find water. Just start digging until you you finally get lucky, all right? And I'm sure that's a lot of work. Um, digging a hole in general is a lot of work. But first thing that they do is they go and then they're trying to find water and they're digging really deep. I'm talking about these things would be really, really deep into the ground to find water. Now, that's amazing just to know that there are rivers under the earth that are flowing, right? So we don't think about that sometimes. The Bible talks about that, by the way, when, the, when during Noah's ark, you know, the, uh, there was water underneath the earth that was coming up out of the earth at the same time that the rain was coming down from above. And, and uh, we don't understand that, but a good portion of the water on this earth is below us. Like it's, it's, it's not even, uh, you know, we can't see it till we dig down and, and get well. So, I don't know, maybe you live on a property that has well water or you've, you've had that. Uh, how many of you like well water? I think it takes some getting used to. <laughs> Every well water I've had tasted a little weird at first, but, um, but what a great find. You know, this would be way more valuable than just about anything else you could find on that land. Um, now, I suppose you find gold or whatever, you know, that's probably uh, good. But, you know, this is a life-giving source. And so let's spiritualize that a little bit. Like in your life, trying to raise a family, trying to live, or you could let's say community. How about our church? In the life of a church, we're wanting to survive. We're wanting to go uh, as God's people. And, and we're wanting to uh, have success, Obviously, we need to have the source of water. We need to have that, that life-giving water, which we know the Bible talks about that a lot. How about John chapter 4? You remember this story where, John, uh, uh, where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he makes reference to this a few different times. We've talked about it already uh, in a few different messages. But John chapter 4, and look at verse 14, he says, but whosoever, drink, uh, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, he says in verse 13. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Now, this is the water that we need. And, of course, the woman at the well said, oh, give me this water, you know, that I never thirst again. And we understand there's a spiritual connotation here. There's a spiritual application being made where the Holy Spirit, you know, if we can put our trust in the Lord and be saved, the Holy Spirit's going to provide everything that we need. And it's going to be this springing, this well of springing water. Now, the first thing we need to do as Christians, whether it is as a church, whether it is heading your household, you know, and trying to lead your household spiritually, or maybe just you're single and and you're, you, you know, you're responsible for your own self, well, guess what? You need water. You need the living Word of God. You need uh, what's going to provide for you spiritually. And there's a great passage uh, in Amos chapter 8. If you can find Amos, let's go ahead and go there real quick. Amos chapter 8. In verse 11, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, That I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And so uh, he's he's warning these people. He's like, hey, there's going to be a time where you're not going to hear from God. There's not going to be any prophecies. And and, uh, and, and what what a terrible famine. 
You know, in your life, you could have times where you're hungry. You could have times where you don't have the food that you think you should, or you don't have the water, the physical water that you think you should have. But to be spiritually dry, to be just thirsty and hungry spiritually, it's a, it's a terrible thing. And as Christians, uh, that ought not be the case. So the first thing we need to do is dig. We need to look for this living water. Uh, of course, if you have salvation, you already have the living water. But we need to continue to dig and to find uh, sustenance, find God's word. Because we don't want this, there's going to be this famine, you know, where, where nobody's interested in God's word. Nobody's reading God's word. And I would say now more than ever in the United States, when we have more Bibles available than ever before, everybody's got... It, they can look it up and find whatever version they want in their in their pocket, you know, in their phone. They can go to the library. They probably got several copies of the Bible at home. Um, there's so much access to the Word of God. Like I said, different translations and all that. But uh, but you know, the problem is people aren't reading it, or they're just reading it for some inspirational quote that they can put on Facebook or something like that, and they're not really allowing God's Word to change their lives. Uh, so the water, so to speak, is not getting in there. Proverbs 23, let's go there. This is the most valuable thing you have in your life, is to be tapped into the Word of God and to have this, this living water springing up. But you know what? We need to search for that. And we need to dig for it and, and invest in it and try to uh, get all that we can. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Okay, uh, you know, without even considering the context and every, every, everything, just think about what is being said. You know, buy the truth. <laughs> now, how do you buy the truth? The point is just invest in it. Make it a priority. You need the Word of God. You need to know truth. You need to know, you need to have wisdom. You need to get the counseling that you need so that you can know what you're supposed to do in your life. This has got to be the most important thing. And this is why I don't understand why in so many people's lives, church is just a secondary, just minor part of, of their life. Now, if I'm preaching the gospel to somebody, you know, I will say, yeah, more importantly than what church you go to, you know, are you, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Uh, because obviously they can be saved and, they can, and, and, and not go to a church. But what we got to be careful, you know, we, we, we want to make it clear to people, though, that like you need to get into among God's people. You need to assemble yourself. You need to get under the preaching of God's word. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. You need all these things to be tapped into this source or else you're going to be in a famine. You know, and the most important thing we can do is. Be invested in the Word of God. And he says, buy truth and sell it not. You know, let's hold on to it and just uh, and make it the most important thing in your life. <clears throat> when it comes to our lives, uh, our households, our church, whatever, uh, we need to not be so worried about other amenities. You know, all the extras, like there's so much that we want in life. And I, I quote this all the time, but surely that's what the Christian life, the center of our life is to know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you. God's going to provide for you. He's going to take care of you. But we need to not be worried in our life about all these amenities. Like, oh, I want this. I want that. You know, we need to first and foremost say, like, am I going to be provided in my life with the word of God? So let's say you're looking for a church. You know, obviously, you guys have been here for a long time. I don't think you're going anywhere. But, <laughs> but if you were looking for a church, well, I think I want to go to a place that just really has some good entertainment and some good music and all that kind of stuff. Like, that's probably not really the thing you need to be looking for, you know. Well, I just, if we have a good study group, you know, that goes, drinks coffee and hangs out with each other and all this kind of stuff. Whoa, what's going on in this study group? Are we really feeding from God's word? Are we going to grow? Or are we just a social club doing all these things? Because that's not really important, you know. Yeah, but what does it look like? I mean, does it look real trendy? And, you know, you got the blue lights and you got the this and that. And it looks really good. I, I don't think you're looking for the right things. If those are what you're looking for, you know what I'm saying? And so that brings me to my next point. 
you know, wells are no good if they're not operable. What good is it if we, if we come to a well, oh, look how beautiful this well is. Look how well, I mean, a Abraham's servants, they really knew how to dig wells. Look at how wonderful this well is. Yeah, but it's not doing you any good because it's stopped up and it's full of dirt. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not providing any kind of water. And so what good is it no matter what, no matter what it looks like? <clears throat> now, in this case, Abraham's, Abraham had... Abraham's servants had already dug up this well. So when he gets to this land, like he's looking, now here's a good place to dig. We know that they dug this well. There must be water down there. And so that's a good place to start, right? Wasn't that true in our life as well? A lot of people in today's Christianity want to reinvent the wheel. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, you know, we need something new. We need we, you know, we need to look at this at a different angle. We need to do something. Well, it's possible. It's possible that everything is, you know, there's got to be a little change. Uh, uh, maybe the water's not running where it used to run. I don't know uh, how to make the application. But, you know, for the most part, what our fathers did, they did it for a reason. And it was a source of water. And so, so it's always good to step back and be like, okay, news not necessarily bad. You know, we always talk about, I, I love to sing the hymns, all right? And that's one of the things. It's just like, hey, this has been passed on to us from all these different generations, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700, 1,800. I love it. I love to recognize some of these uh, time periods and be like, oh, I love the songs from that era. Or I love the words, the wording of, of the songs. Like, I don't know what a lot of the words mean until I, until I do some study. Nowadays, I do. But whenever I was a kid, I remember singing those songs and saying, what in the world does that mean? What is bringing in the sheaves? What's a sheave? Uh, you know, and that's just a, <laughs> a silly example. There's a whole lot harder words in there to understand. Uh, but, you know, it's passed down to us. From years and years and years, and I know there were some guys with some some bad doctrine, uh, and we're still holding on to some of the songs, even though they didn't always teach great doctrine. But but there's some that's historically there's something that's been passed on by guys who were seeking the Lord and and uh, they're searching for this, and and I believe many of them were saved and had the Holy Spirit, and so uh, we're 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 looking at the same for the same things that they were looking for. Why would we want to f try to go somewhere else? Now, I, I often will, will tell people, like, just because a song is new, you know, oh, you only sing out of the hymnals, right? Well, no, we have specials up here from some, sometimes for, uh, that are brand new songs, you know. Uh, well, it's been a while since we actually had a brand new song, but, you know, maybe just uh, in the last uh, century, that's pretty new. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, <clears throat> just because it's new, maybe it's in the last decade, you know. And we're singing this song because it's, it speaks to us. Just because it's new doesn't mean that it's bad. But if somebody just wants to throw out the old and be like, hey, we need to find something new, we're going to miss out. You know, why go digging for well, digging holes in the ground looking for wells when our fathers already left us these places to dig? It's like, okay, water's here, water's here, water's here. Why won't we start by digging in those wells and tapping into it? And so when we talk about old paths, in church, you know, we talk about looking for the old past and, and staying in the old past and, and seeing what our fathers did and their fathers did. Like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, I'm happy with the faith of our fathers. I'm happy with the fact that we're still using the King James Bible. And that's a whole other sermon for another day. But I'm glad that we're using the King James Bible. All these new churches, oh, we got to get away from that. There's a lot of independent Baptist churches. How do we get our congregations away from the King James Bible because it's not relevant anymore to our society. It most certainly is. They just need to learn how to tap into it and learn how to uh, open up that hole so that we can receive the water. <clears throat> I love the old hymns. I love, uh, I love, Brother Allen and I talk about this a lot because he's, he's on the same page with this, but uh, it was instilled in me. Now, I don't like dressing up as as regularly. You can ask my wife. <laughs> she, she wishes I would dress up a little bit nicer. Uh, I just don't lie. I like to be comfortable, you know, and I'm, I like to do different things. I'm not like a brother, brother A.F. Collins, you know, he used to wear suits and he'd go fishing and he'd have a suit on. <laughs> like, you know, I don't know how late he did that, like how, how long into his life he did that. But at some point the story goes, you know, he would always have a suit jacket and he would have, uh, uh, you know, he would just look a certain way. Well, it's been passed down to me to the point where I like 
to go to a church where the preacher is wearing a suit whenever he preaches. Now, is it spiritual? Does it mean that if someone's not wearing a suit, then they can't, then they're not preaching the right truths from the Bible? No, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Does it mean they're sinning if they don't wear a suit? Well, no. You know, that's just a preference. But I sure like it because you know what it does? It it continues this thing that's been passed on that we're going to do our best. We're going to look a certain way. We're going to take it seriously. We're not going to be casual about it. And it's stuck. You know what I mean? It, and, and, and you're hearing that from a guy that doesn't like dressing up. But I'll do it for the Lord because it's something that's been passed on. And like I want to tap into what our fathers originally dug for us. You know, we don't have to have church buildings that are fancy and, 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 uh, and all this. Uh, we just need to take care of what we have. It doesn't have to be a fancy well. If it's not functioning, if it's not operable, then it's no good. What's the point? It's all show with no water. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, he's talking about these false prophets who are pretending to be something that they're not, but I, the, the wording that he uses is exactly what we're talking about. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. He's talking about these false prophets, and he says, These are wells without water. Clouds they are, carried with the tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. And there's a couple of different places in the Bible where it talks about clouds without water, you know, you ever uh, just recently, like it got really dark out and look up in the sky, it looks like it's going to rain. And then the wind just carries it on. It just passes by and, uh, and you never get any rain, right? Well, that's a false alarm. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> coming up on a well, let's say you're thirsty and you're coming out on this, uh, you know, oh, here's a well right here. And then you walk up to it and it's a well without water. What good is it? Right. And so we want to find these wells that are operable. And uh, of course, we got to dig out you know, those things that have been stopped up and filled with earth, you know, because somewhere down the road, some Philistine decided to stop up the well and say, we don't want that anymore. Hey, you know what? I think it'd be a good idea to go dig those back up and, and get that get to that water that's in there. Doesn't matter how things appear on the outside. You know, what's important is, is your family being fed? Is your family being hydrated uh, with, the, uh, with the water of the Word? Are you, is your own soul being satisfied by, by the Word? Is it accessible to you? Now, sometimes people just aren't drinking. <laughs> you know, it's there, but they just don't like water. I don't like the taste of water. I mean, how many of you guys don't drink water because you don't like the taste of water? A lot of hands are going to go up, or, or, you're, or some people are lying, right? But you need water. So, well, maybe if I add some Kool-Aid to it. Maybe if I add some coffee to it, right? Co water, uh, coffee has water in it. Yeah, but you need water. Think about the water that you need, not the am amenities that you put into the water, okay? Uh, we need to, ge to get spiritually hydrated. That's the most important thing we could be looking for. And so we need one. Uh, we need to be digging. Our whole life needs to be about digging these wells. And then when we find them, uh, you know, we got to make sure they're operable and, and, and they work. But here's the third point that I want to make. Once a good well is established, others want it. Now, that doesn't mean that they're willing to do the work for it. You know, that's the hard part uh, about it. But, but others want it. You know, and, and I don't want to just use myself as an illustration here, but in the, in the life of godly men and women who love the Lord, are in, in, in tune with the Lord, they're reading the Bible, they're studying, you know, they're trying to raise families, they're doing it right, they're not getting involved in the ways of the world and these different sin and, and everything. It tends to be, like, I, I know it's not always the case, um, you know, not everything that looks good is, is good. Uh, but all the people I know that that seems like a sincere thing, that they love the Lord and they want all these things, their lives are, they got their lives together. You know what I mean? They're not falling apart. Their family's not falling apart. They don't hate each other. They don't, you know, they're not involved in all this, all this junk. They don't have to worry about going to jail. They don't have to, you know, their lives are, are they got it together because they're doing it God's way and they're drinking from that, from that well. And so all of a sudden, other people are going to see that and be like, man, that's what I want, you know. And there does come this point, you know, where, where we as Christians, 
can kind of feel like, you know what, you're not invited. Like this, we've been working hard to get our families this way. We don't want your influence in here. Uh, you don't want your grubby hands to get a hold of our clean water, you know. And, and there does come a point where churches sometimes can be this like super spiritual, you know, we four, no more. And, uh, and, and, and then there's this real disconnect, you know. Other people see it and they're like, man, I want, I want what they have. But they're not letting me in, you know what I mean, or something like that. Or sometimes you offer it to them and they just don't get it. They just don't. They, I don't know why you're drinking this stuff. It tastes nasty. You know, who likes the taste of water? Well, you know what? Drink it because you need it to, to, to survive. But people will come along and they'll say, like, man, we want some of this. And sometimes it's hard to share. Like it's 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 more it's it's easier for Christians to just sit on the knowledge that they have just take it home with them, enjoy their family, and not let other people in on the deal. Okay. Now, as I read this story in Genesis 26, it seems, it seems like Isaac and his servants are just pushovers. Because they work hard, they find this well, they dig it up, they say, oh, yeah, we found water, now we can set up camp, and we can begin to build, and we can have all this stuff. And then, and then all of a sudden, the, the Philistines and Gerar are like, hey, that's our water. You know, You're on our property, and that's our water, and they strive together. Isaac just says, you know what? Uh, good. Drink your water, enjoy life. We're going to go over here, and we're going to dig our, uh, another well. They go over there, they dig a well. We found water, yay, God blessed, what a wonderful thing, we're going to enjoy our life now. And then all of a sudden the other group of Philistines that are on that territory, they're just like, hey, that's our water, right? Okay, we'll go build other, and eventually, you know, they're left alone because everybody has room and all these other people uh, have what they need. You know, it's actually our job as Christians to share this water. Now, people don't always want to drink it, but we need to make it available. And so, obviously, if we're going to be telling other people about this water, like we, it, it needs to be known that it's there. They need to see it in us that, hey, we're well hydrated and we've got this blessing and we're smiling and we're happy and everything's going well. I'm not telling you to be fake, but I'm just saying like walk in the word, get spiritually hydrated so that the world sees like you're not sick and dying. Like you're, you're actually a, a, a Christian that's got his life together. And then they begin to want that. And we should be willing to share with them and say like, hey, you build your family on the same water that we have. And, uh, and sometimes it's weary, weary, wearisome. Sometimes it's, it's tiresome to go out and be preaching the gospel and to uh, be sharing it with people that don't understand it and trying to show it to them and, and do all these things. But that's our job. We should be trying to share this water. If others want it, share it with them, you know. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, we're just digging, digging wells and trying to find where this water is. Some things work, some things don't work. You know, you might come across some wells that our fathers, forefathers dug up that, yeah, maybe they should have left it, <laughs> left it alone. Maybe it's not producing water like, like we thought it should. But, uh, but we're going by and just trying to do the best we can to hydrate ourselves. Uh, we don't want a famine of, of, of God's Word, but we want to make it available to others as well. So that's our life as Christians, digging wells, finding uh, the source of the spring of water and, and living in that, but then also making sure that we continue sharing that with others so that there's room for all of us, all right? That is part of church planning. We've been talking about that on Wednesdays. Uh, and, and that's part of, you know, raising your family and just moving on and, and, and moving forward until the Lord comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this church. Thank you for the family uh, that we have as a church family. And, and I thank you for providing for us your word. We certainly don't have an excuse not to have the word. We've all got our Bibles. Uh, we've got access to it. Plenty of, uh, uh, of ways that we can feed ourselves and, and drink of your word and and I uh, pray, Lord, that you help us take advantage of that. Help me as a minister to minister that word, and others may drink it. And I pray that you would help us to be willing to share it with others uh, so that more and more people could uh, sh 
could get in on this on this huge blessing of the well that's springing up within us. I pray you uh, would be glorified. Keep us safe this evening as we go home. In Jesus, name I pray. Amen.